and recovery of the team as well. So don't go anywhere. Uh, we are just waiting on a couple of major events here, enjoying some uh, views of the crew inside the capsule, uh, as you can see on screen. Dragon, the orbit sequence start in five minutes. Copy, we're through. So we are continuing to track the uh, return of Crew 2 and the astronauts back to planet Earth. Uh, we just heard we are just moments away from entering the deorbit sequence. Uh, we did a quick fact check on some of the burns that we've been monitoring throughout today's flight as we've been providing continuous coverage. And we did get confirmation that that uh, departure phase burn, which we have discussed, takes the dragon out of the co-elliptic phasing that is really uh, matching the International Space Station uh, with both the perigee and apogee and puts it on a course uh, with that landing site, which is Pensacola, Florida. That did happen, uh, so, so we do have confirmation that all of the phasing burns, the departure burns that are necessary to line Dragon up for the deorbit sequence, which we're hearing is about to uh, take place here momentarily, uh, that we are all lined up. All of the burns have taken place. Dragon is in a good phase, a good position to get ready for this next sequence of very critical events.
And what that means is we have just one more burn left, the deorbit burn. Right. A couple of things need to happen, again, before we um, start this. Uh, in uh, about three minutes, we'll begin to maneuver or slew the dragon uh, to the appropriate um, uh, attitude in order to prep for claw separation and then trunk separation. Mm -hmm. After that, we'll slew back. Um, the, uh, bulk, the four forward bulkhead thrusters um, underneath the nose cone uh, will fire for about 16 and a half minutes. That will be what slows down Dragon and brings its altitude down enough to start to um, uh, sort of uh, hit some of the um, uh, atmospheric uh, particles of Earth. And then from there, we'll start to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere enter that blackout period uh, for about seven minutes where there's just plasma being built up uh, around the exterior of Dragon. Uh, so we'll lose communications for about seven minutes. Um, after that, we'll, we'll regain communications. Uh, we have uh, parachute deploys. We have two mm -hmm. sets. Uh, first up is the drogue chutes that will take the Dragon, uh, the Dragon capsule velocity from about 350 miles per hour to 120 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. From there, the uh, main chutes will deploy, taking us from 120 miles an hour uh, down to about 15 uh, mm -hmm. for a nice soft landing uh, on off the coast, uh, off the co uh, the Gulf of Mexico. So that is uh, going to kick off here very shortly. We're coming up on just about an hour from the predicted splashdown time. Uh, we did hear there were slight adjustments in some of the sequence, and that sequence, the deorbit sequence itself, about to begin here momentarily, uh, with starting with the claw separation and trunk separation, but that'll kick off. Once that sequence starts, it's about an hour timeline uh, from the time that that sequence starts to the time that we are in the water. Uh, we're still targeting 7.33 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 10.33 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, so again, uh, everything that we just talked about is going to happen in that hour. So, right. uh, you know, we, we, we saw the crew enjoy their meal. They donned their spacesuits once again. Uh, and I really had uh, a bit of a respite before right. these dy very dynamic portions of, uh, of the, the operation. So uh, things will definitely get exciting here in the next couple of minutes. And we'll be with you every step of the way. Uh, we're expecting communications with the crew throughout each of these different phases, confirmation of trunk separation, uh, the, claw, the claw opening, the claw separation, trunk separation. Uh, when the deorbit burn starts, it's going to be uh, quite, uh, quite a long time that those forward bulkhead Dracos will fire. It is the longest burn of the entire flight, the eight and a half hour journey from undocking from the International Space Station to splashing down off the coast of Florida, 16 and a half minutes. In this particular phasing, because of the short flight, uh, that is a much longer burn uh, with some of the longer phases when we're talking about 18 or 19 hours, uh, Dragon, it gets a lot shorter. The sequence start. There you go. Copy. So uh, again, that was confirmation of the beginning of the deorbit sequence. Again, it involves uh, a, a number of different um, items to, to occur. Right now, again, the, the dragon is starting to maneuver itself, orient itself uh, to prep for claw and trunk separation. So the first step is the claw separation. Right now we're in the preparation phase. Uh, this is an automatic sequence now that we're in the uh, deorbit sequence, which just kicked off. Uh, it's an automatic sequence that starts with claw separation. The claw is uh, essentially the, umbil uh, the umbilical that routes uh, uh, power to the uh, Dragon capsule. It's connected um, as part of the trunk. Um, so we'll disconnect that first, um, uh, pop off the uh, trunk, so to speak. And once that happens, the uh, Dragon capsule is um, uh, running exclusively, ex exclusively on its own um, internal batteries. Right. And there's plenty to spare, too, through the uh, six months or so that the uh, Dragon has been attached to the International Space Station. It really hasn't had to rely on its own power at all. The International Space Station has gigantic basketball court-sized uh, 
solar arrays in addition to a couple of new solar arrays that some of the Crew-2 astronauts themselves installed and deployed on the outside of the station, all providing power not only to the International Space Station, but to the Dragon while it's been docked. Uh, during the docked phase, the Dragon itself is connected via umbilical uh, that provides communication and, of course, power uh, to the vehicle. So the batteries were fully charged uh, for the ride home. And then even upon separation, you can see, uh, you were able to see through some of the views, the uh, uh, trunk itself has a series of solar arrays that are on one side of the trunk, able to provide a small amount of power throughout this, uh, these, this uh, phase of flight. We are expecting to get confirmation of claw separation and then shortly after trunk separation. And we did hear claw separation is confirmed. Dragon is now automatically uh, going into the preparations for trunk separation. trunk itself. Um, separating it exposes the heat shield. Again, that is very necessary uh, to uh, protect the capsule from uh, the high temperatures um, that uh, it will be experiencing during um, re-entry. Dragon, nominal trunk jettison. Copy, nominal trunk jettison. It's a great way to start off the deorbit sequence. Um, the trunk is off uh, and everything is uh, going smoothly so far. Coming up next, uh, we're going to be reorienting the Dragon and then um, starting up the deorbit burn. Right now we are in a slew. So now that the Dragon has uh, physically separated the trunk, the trunk has confirmed to have separated itself from the Dragon capsule. Uh, that slew had Dragon oriented slightly to the side relative to how it is orbiting uh, to allow there not to be a conjunction between the two um, uh, bodies as they uh, now enter into the deorbit phase. So now the Dragon itself is slewing into a position with the focus forward bulkhead Draco is pointing straight on the velocity bar or the V-bar, essentially the same direction that the Dragon is orbiting, uh, to be prepared to fire the four bulkhead Dracos for 16 and a half minutes. Uh, that sequence should be coming up here in about two minutes. We should be hearing the confirmation that the forward bulkhead Dracos are firing. And we'll, so we'll, we'll monitor that, make sure that the deorbit bird is good and that we have a good burn. Uh, once that burn is complete, Dragon is committed to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and splash down off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Yeah, that's going to be the last time that we fire the, the forward bulkhead thrusters on the Dragon vehicle. Uh, and so, um, again, after we, we finish the deorbit burn, the nose cone, which is currently open right now, we're going to be closing that. It takes a couple of minutes to close, and then it latches shut. Um, this protects the um, avionics and all of the, um, the items uh, underneath the nose cone, uh, but we'll latch that shut because we're not going to be firing the Dracos anymore. Uh, and then Dragon really will be... Um, uh, on its trajectory towards the primary landing site off the coast of Pensacola. And we're hearing confirmation from the flight control teams here in Hawthorne. The Dragon capsule is now switched its attitude. It's slewed into the deorbit position and is in the deorbit attitude. Now standing by for about a minute from now, uh, where the Dragon itself will fire those four forward bulkhead Dracos, beginning the deorbit sequence, a very critical part of today's flight. So yeah, we will be bringing continuous coverage uh, all the way through uh, splashdown and recovery of the crew. On screen right now is a view of uh, Hawthorne Mission Control. Uh, folks are starting to gather around, ex uh, anticipating uh, Crew 2's return, again, off the coast of Florida um, in, in under an hour now. That's right. We are in the home stretch.
So it is worth mentioning again that the Dragon vehicle itself is uh, a, a very um, sophisticated, intelligent vehicle. Um, the maneuvers that um, it has been doing throughout its undocking phase and a part of its uh, downhill um, sequences uh, really are autonomous. Um, the crew uh, it, um, are definitely trained uh, to help support Dragon in case um, things go off nominal, but really for the most part, Dragon is piloting itself. It knows where it's at, where it wants to go, and it's making all these minor adjustments um, as needed. So uh, the crew is in good hands. Uh, they are uh, definitely on um, the trajectory they need to be uh, to, to return home safely back here on Earth. So we're just moments away. Again, the deorbit sequence has started right on time. So we had a confirmed claw separation and trunk separation. Dragon is now in an orientation with a forward bulkhead Dracos pointed where they need to be for this very critical burn, the deorbit burn. Uh, we've been waiting for this moment for quite some time. Uh, a lot of the departure burns that we've been following over the past couple of hours have been really in anticipation of this moment. We've been following weather all along the way uh, because once we start this deorbit burn, really there's no going back. Um, that means that the dragon itself is committed uh, to return back to Earth. And confirm that the deorbit burn has started. Initial checks show that the dynamics of that burn are looking pretty good. This is going to be a long burn, 16 and a half minutes. So a quick recap, within the last 10 minutes, a lot has happened. The Dragon has jettisoned its trunk and initiated the deorbit burn, uh, which started now at about uh, 6.40 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. For these operations, Dragon and SpaceX closely coordinate with the United States Coast Guard to establish a 10 nautical mile safety zone to ensure public safety and for the safety of those involved in the recovery operations, as well as the crew on board their returning spacecraft. Multiple notices are issued to the mariners in, the, in advance and during recovery operations and the Coast Guard patrol boats are deployed to discourage boaters from entering the splashdown zones. We really want to stress to the public uh, the need to respect this safety zone. Recovering a spacecraft from the water is a hazardous operation and any other boats interfering increases the risk to astronauts in the capsule, the teams working to recover them from the water and the safety of those that come too close. For the safety of the crew and your safety, we recommend that you sit back and watch and we'll be bringing you the best possible coverage of our astronauts homecoming. And like I mentioned earlier, this deorbit burn is the last time that those four forward Draco thrusters will fire. Uh, Dragon Endeavor has not yet entered Earth's atmosphere yet. Um, this deorbit burn is what will line the vehicle up and put it on its final trajectory to the landing. So to the landing site in the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. So right now, Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma, uh, they're using their screens to keep tabs on the burn durations, uh, Draco thruster firings, and trajectory details like entry angle, capsule perigee, and how much distance remaining until the deorbit burn uh, is terminated. They have access to that uh, with the displays in front of them. Uh, again, Dragon is essentially flying itself, so all the crew has to do is uh, stay strapped into their seats, and keep tabs on things. Uh, so we're waiting to hear the call out for uh, nominal burn uh, to confirm completion of the deorbit burn for uh, Dragon Endeavor. That's going to be coming up uh, in about 12 minutes, 13 minutes. Uh, so still uh, uh, a bit longer to go on this deorbit burn. That's right. We're coming up on about three minutes into the deorbit burn, and it is a very long burn, particularly with this phasing, uh, which is the short trip from undocking to splashdown that doesn't include a sleep period or anything for the crew. They're really in it for the long haul. Um, these forward bulkhead Dracos need to fire for about 16 and a half minutes. We've seen very similar profiles for some of the other missions. Crew 1 and I believe Crew 2 had a, had a pretty similar profile, or not Crew 2, um, Demo 2 had a very similar profile file uh, about roughly the same period of time uh, from the time of undocking to the time of splashdown. So it seems to be a pretty popular profile. So we'll just sit back and uh, make sure that the deorbit burn is, is continuing to look good. And so far, teams are tracking that it is. We're about four minutes in at this point, um, at, which is uh, into a 16 and a half minute burn. 
And on screen is uh, our four astronauts on board Dragon. Uh, left to right, Issa's Thomas Pesquet. Uh, he is the mission specialist. Uh, then we have the pilot, Megan MacArthur, and uh, the commander, Shane Kimbrough, both from NASA. And then we have JAXA astronaut, Akihiko Hoshide, uh, who is also the mission specialist. So uh, again, they are both, uh, they are all in their suits, um, strapped in and um, eagerly re waiting their, their return and uh, uh, a breath of fresh earth air uh, <laughs> in about 45 minutes. Oh, excuse me, um, 45 minutes until splashdown, right. then about an hour until they can egress the, the vehicle. Each of them has had a long journey on board the International Space Station. They've been in space for 199 days. 198 of those were attached to the International Space Station. Each of them have had very critical roles uh, in the, some of the activities that have taken place on board. Uh, Thomas Pesquet uh, just handed over command of the International Space Station. He was commander for just a little bit uh, for the very beginning of Expedition 66. Uh, uh, he handed, he took over command of the International Space Station from Aki Hoshide, who had it for quite some time uh, during Expedition 65. He was the International Space Station commander. Uh, of course, we heard that uh, Shane Kimbrough is the commander for the uh, Crew Dragon vehicle, uh, and each of those three have conducted uh, several spacewalks on board the International Space Station. There have been four spacewalks completed uh, that each of them took part in. Thomas Pesquet taking place, taking part in all four of them. Uh, there was one uh, spacewalk that was to set up uh, one of the station's power systems with a modification kit in preparation for future solar arrays. That was done by Thomas Pesquet and Aki Hoshide, the first time uh, that international astronauts not from the U.S. or Russia uh, were part of a, uh, uh, a spacewalk, so they did make history there. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Shane Kimbrough conducted three of those himself, uh, so he has nine spacewalks under his belt, and he has uh, one of the all-time records for most amount of time in space. For any U.S. astronaut, he's sitting at 388 days uh, of his career total over his uh, three space flights to the, inter uh, well, to the International Space Station and as part of a shuttle mission as well. Six minutes into the 16-minute deorbit burn. We're looking good. Yeah, earlier we had a um, out-of-plane burn and uh, that was also used as a propellant wasting burn. And so we dumped a lot of mass with the propellant, uh, propellants that we don't need anymore. That, in combination with the, the trunk uh, jettison that we just had, sheds a lot of mass from the vehicle. It actually makes this deorbit burn a lot more efficient, um, so that way um, uh, we can um, uh, be as, again, as efficient as possible to slow down the vehicle, bring its altitude down uh, in order for it to begin its reentry phase. This is a very critical phase. We've, we've seen a lot of action over these uh, past couple of hours as we've been providing some continuous coverage. Uh, it all started with some uh, hatch closure uh, where the Dragon crew said goodbye to the crew on board the International Space Station. Only three crew members on board now. That includes uh, Commander Anton Shkaplerov from Roscosmos, as well as Piotr Dubrov of Roscosmos, and then uh, Mark Vandehei, who is pulling the long haul here. He's going to be on station for almost a year, uh, uh, and he'll be really the responsible for the handover uh, that the Crew 2 astronauts would have done if they were to... Uh, um, have the Crew 3 astronauts arrive before them. But again, we've, we've mentioned this a couple of times, Andy, throughout our coverage. Uh, part of the reason why we're executing a deorbit burn right now, heading for a splashdown off the coast of Pensacola, is because the weather looks really, really good. And weather is, a, uh, is one of those primary driving factors for taking a crew home. Uh, if the weather looks this good with, with very calm, you said lake-like um, states is what we heard on the loops, uh, very calm winds, uh, and of course, we, 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 get, we did get confirmation that the skies are clear as well. So we might even get some pretty good views from the WB-57 as well as the ship, uh, the recovery ship, Go Navigator, as the crew is entering. Um, it's, it's really just, it's too perfect to pass up. Yeah, and, and, and that's really uh, sort of the, the, um, the story here. Um, we originally planned to launch Crew 3 right. prior to Crew 
two coming home, and they were going to do the handoff in person at the International Space Station. Weather wasn't quite cooperating with us um, Halloween weekend, uh, but again, Gary, you mentioned this this recovery weather is too good to pass up. Right. And so um, the the teams that have been supporting this mission, uh, or really both missions, uh, really uh, this is a testament to their flexibility um, to be able to uh, get this together and make sure that the crew too can uh, come home safely uh, in the midst of, again, this uh, really optimal weather. Very, very true. And, and again, we are monitoring the weather, and, and it does look good out in the Gulf Coast. Part of the reason that we're uh, landing the crew right now in the Gulf is because the weather over there looks good. And the reason why we're uh, we're going to wait to launch the Crew-3 astronauts no earlier than November 10th uh, is because the weather out there is something that we continue to monitor. It's not only the weather out at the uh, East Coast, uh, off the coast of Cape Canaveral uh, in Florida that we're looking at, but really the weather all along the ascent corridor has to cooperate as well. So that includes all along the eastern seaboard, that includes uh, the North Pacific. All of that has to look good uh, because uh, really in any abort scenario, uh, you'd be looking at the crew um, escaping from the top of the Falcon 9 rocket using those Super Dracos. We were talking about Super Dracos a little earlier uh, and splashing down anywhere along those sites. And so you have to make sure that the weather is cooperating really all along the way. So it's got to be the right conditions. Yeah, there are um, uh, multiple teams that plan for all sorts of these types of right. contingencies. It is fantastic when things go well, as we've uh, been seeing for a very long time, and, and we love that. Uh, but uh, we want to make sure that in case um, anything were to go awry, we have plans for that. And weather, again, is one of the things that we need to make sure we pay attention to. So we're about six six minutes away from right. uh, finishing this deorbit burn. Again, this is the last burn for the Dragon vehicle. After this, we'll close the nose cone, flip the Dragon around, and uh, start to head into the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and um, really, uh, after this, it's it's really about 30 minutes, about 40, 30 or 40 minutes until we see the Dragon capsule in the Gulf of Mexico. That's it's, right. gonna, it's gonna happen very quickly. <laughs> it is, a lot is going to happen. In fact, when it comes to the parachutes, they are, th that sequence is automatic, but it happens seconds from each other. The uh, mortars themselves are deployed to uh, release two drogue parachutes that slows the uh, Dragon capsule down from 350 miles per hour initially. Uh, those are the, the uh, right after we get outside of the blackout zone, which is uh, when the uh, uh, Dragon itself is entering through the atmosphere, engulfed in plasma, so the communications get, can't get through. But uh, right when we exit out of that and we get an acquisition of signal and are able to talk to the crew inside Dragon again, uh, they should be traveling at roughly 350 uh, miles an hour. But once we deploy those drogue chutes, all of that's going to really happen at about um, 7.29 p.m. Pacific time, 10.29 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the drogue parachutes will deploy, uh, they'll stay out for a little bit, and then 40 seconds later, the, ma the four main parachutes will deploy. Uh, and from 350 miles an hour, with that sequence that's happening really in the matter of one minute uh, with all of the parachutes, that'll gently slow down the uh, Dragon and its crew down to about 15 miles an hour. Yeah, and, and we, we mentioned safety. We've been talking about safety right. throughout this whole broadcast. As soon as the Dragon capsule hits the water, one of the first things that happens is the main chutes get cut. And what this means is um, uh, today there are really no winds, uh, essentially, but um, uh, we don't want, uh, we wouldn't want the Dragon capsule to be pulled by wind in any direction, so we'll cut the parachutes immediately upon splashdown. And there's a, there's a boat that is, uh, part of its main function is to go out and recover that, that parachute. That uh, cutting of the main parachutes happens automatically on board uh, the Dragon, but when we were talking about some of the physical buttons that the crew yes. have on their display panel, one of those physical buttons, which is really important to have instead of having it on a touch screen that you have to navigate to, really easy access to a button that says cut the parachutes. If for whatever reason they weren't to automatically do it themselves, which we've seen on some of the uh, uh, previous crewed missions, they did automatically cut, um, uh, they do have the ability to do so. Yeah, and these parachutes have been tested uh, mm -hmm. hundreds of times. Um, um, and so, uh, you know, the design, uh, parachutes can be tricky, but, uh, you know, we've, we've used these parachutes as a part of all the cargo missions prior to the upgraded Dragon, and now we're using them um, as part of um, this operations, too. 
as you mentioned, uh, as the right after the uh, dragon splashes down in the ocean, there are two what are called fast boats that will uh, that are part of the uh, prime recovery team that will immediately go out to uh, the capsule. Um, one of the boats will go right over to the capsule and start, out, start outfitting it uh, with some uh, rigging equipment. They'll do a sniff check to make sure there are no hazardous uh, gases that are leaking from the spacecraft, make sure it's safe for the next uh, series of events where the GO Navigator's uh, recovery ship will go out and hoist it onto the ship itself. But you were mentioning the other fast boat. It serves as a backup to that boat just in case it were, you know, some motor function were to happen and, and it can't get out to the capsule in time. But uh, it's prime function if the other boat is looking pretty good, uh, is to go collect the parachutes. Yes. So again, about about two minutes, two minutes. Uh, from the, for the for the end of the final burn, um, the dragon and the crew have gone through um, a number of burns throughout uh, today's uh, downhill phase. Uh, so um, again, we are uh, nearing the end of sort of the marathon here. Uh, so this must be exciting for the crew uh, on board the Dragon as well, knowing that uh, this is the last burn that they're going to feel, uh, last burn that they're going to hear. And uh, after this, it's really going to be um, a smooth, smooth sailing, uh, so to speak, uh, into the Atlantic Ocean or into the Gulf of Mexico. So the words we're waiting to hear right now are nominal deorbit burn. Uh, those are very important words that will be uh, sent over to the crew. Right now, the nose cone has been opened to expose the four forward bulkhead Dracos that have been doing a lot of the hefty li heavy lifting with this Z-orbit burn, uh, pointing straight uh, at the velocity bar, uh, bar. It's a retro-firing of the, of the uh, thrusters to slow the vehicle down and really ultimately make contact with the uh, atmosphere. That's the point of this burn. But um, as long as we have a good burn, uh, it'll be just a matter of a couple of minutes. It's, it's a very quick sequence to close the nose cone. It's a very important function uh, to close the nose cone. It protects the forward bulkhead Dracos. Uh, it protects the docking mechanism that it's been, that's been used to keep Dragon attached to the International Space Station for six months. It protects some of the guidance and navigation equipment. Of course, this vehicle is uh, reusable. We're seeing it now. This is a reused vehicle. Um, it, it was used originally on, on the Demo 2 mission. Uh, so all critical functions that need to be protected uh, before it slews to the position uh, where the heat shield is pointed right towards the Earth and does the heavy lifting of protecting the, the capsule and, of course, more importantly, the crew inside uh, from the 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit that's going to be experienced as the Dragon capsule enters the Earth. As part of um, the recovery operations yep. uh, after um, Tra Dragon, do you have a burn complete? Performance nominal. Nose cone closure has been initiated. Copy all good. Do you have a burn? That is the news that we were looking for, Andy. Uh, nominal deorbit burn. Uh, that means that that burn did its job. Uh, you see immediately we're going into closing the nose cone. So now that it's done its job, uh, the forward bulkhead Dracos will not be fired again. We're going to close uh, the nose cone and protect some of those critical equipment uh, and get the dragon oriented in a position ready for entry. Yeah, so it takes a couple of minutes for the nose cone to close. It doesn't just right. swing shut. Um, and so it'll be closed, and then there'll be latches that will secure it into position. Uh, from there, uh, we will slew the dragon uh, into his orientation to make sure that the heat shields are, are, are facing forward, so to speak. Um, they will, the heat shield will be what meets the Earth's atmosphere first, to absorb and dissipate all that heat upon re-entry, and then um, you know we'll uh, enter our, we'll go through the, the, the blackout period uh, uh, where we won't have comms to uh, from Dragon to ground or, dra or ground to Dragon. Uh, then after that, we'll deploy our parachutes and land. So the atmosphere is going to do a lot of the work here to slow the vehicle down. We're still close to orbital velocity. Of course, we're a little bit slower because we're dropping in altitude, and that is purposeful. Uh, the Dragon and the crew inside is now committed to enter the Earth's atmosphere and splash down off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Uh, Dragon systems look good. The crew is uh, monitoring every step of the way and checking in and saying that they are following closely. Everything's looking good on that end, and of course, the weather is, is cooperating, which is super 
super essential. Um, so we're about to uh, enter into the atmosphere and slow down all the way down to 350 miles per hour. It's going to be a number of minutes uh, for that procedure to take place. It takes about seven minutes uh, from the time that we enter into the Earth's atmosphere uh, and lose the signal with the crew. So don't worry. Um, that is normal. We expect a loss of signal for about seven minutes. Uh, the communications can't get through the plasma that's engulfing uh, the dragon on its way uh, in. Uh, but it should be about a seven minute period as predicted, right? So there might be a little extra lag time in there just depending on a, on a series of events. But uh, they'll be calling to the crew at the end of that anticipated period to check in and, and hear uh, how that sequence went and make sure everything is good for the next series of automatic events, which is the deployment of the parachutes and eventual splashdown. Yeah, it is important to note that uh, prior to the deorbit sequence, uh, we did hear communications from the crew to the uh, to the core here. Uh, they were updated on timelines, so the crew uh, onboard Dragon knows exactly what to expect. To yeah. they know when the blackout period is going to happen. They know when um, approximately the signal is going to be coming back. And we typically hear pings um, sometimes from Dragon to ground, or and sometimes from ground to Dragon, um, waiting for um, the acquisition of signal. Um, so there are no surprises. Every, every, really every, every party that's supporting this mission is well aware of what is about to happen. So it's going to be a number of minutes until we actually get into the entry sequence. Uh, right now we're coming up at about 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, which is 10 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. It's about uh, roughly another 20 minutes uh, until we actually get into that entry interface. Um, uh, so, so it's still some time. Uh, we, we are right now in a good position with the uh, deorbit burn sequence initiated, and uh, it, it puts uh, Dragon in an orientation getting ready. Uh, we can see it slewing now uh, uh, to get ready for that entry prep. Um, uh, really with the heat shield pointed towards the Earth. So we're in the final stretch here, Andy. It's, uh, it's really happening. So we should get confirmation, um, uh, if not already, that the nose cone has closed, and we are getting confirmation. Nose cone is closed. Mm -hmm. And so again, we are slewing to the right orientation, and um, during this, uh, the, for the next 19 minutes or so, yep. Dragon's altitude is decreasing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once we get uh, low enough and start building that friction, uh, we will enter the blackout communication. So around 7, uh, 19 p.m. Pacific time is when we're expecting uh, the blackout communications period. So as we begin the second half of entry, Dragon is now beginning to flush Nitrox into the cabin and continuing to top off Shane, Megan, Aki, and Tomas' suits with cool air. Again, this is what we uh, what will allow the cabin temperature to remain comfortable while external temperatures reach 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. That heat shield is pointed forward, uh, leading the capsule to that landing site. Yes, and we are targeting the primary site today, um, uh, tonight, uh, off the coast of Pensacola, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, so very exciting. Under 30 minutes, or just over 30 minutes, uh, 7.33 p.m. Pacific time is our targeted uh, splashdown time. Right. We did hear that go count call up to the crew that we're still targeting that same exact site, even with a slight shifts in some of the other uh, events, uh, uh, particularly with the uh, acqu um, loss and acquisition of signal, that seven minute blackout period that we were talking about. But uh, all in all, we're still looking at that same time for uh, splashing down uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. So stay with us. We're going to continue to provide coverage through this uh, very dynamic sequence. Um, we will, even after splashdown, we're going to remain on air. We want to make sure that the crew is safe once they splash down off the Gulf of Mexico. So once they splash down, it takes less than an hour um, in, in uh, nominal recovery procedures to go out to the boat, uh, or to go out to the capsule, rather, and uh, outfit it to get onto the Dragon Nest, which is on the recovery ship, and bring it in for the hatch uh, opening, the side hatch, and recovery covering the, uh, the crew inside. We'll continue to provide coverage uh, as each of the four astronauts egress or exit from the capsule itself. Uh, we hopefully will get uh, some views of them, uh, maybe pumping fists, or, or as long as they're feeling healthy, of course, uh, uh, we'll get some views of them on the recovery ship. And after that, we are looking forward to talking to some leadership from some of the respective agencies. Uh, we're expecting to have uh, some representatives from NASA, the European 
Space Agency and the Japanese, uh, uh, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency call in to provide some final comments now that we have, we can declare a mission success. All coming up very soon, but first we have to pay attention, of course, on the mission itself, making sure that these crew members uh, are about to return to homes, uh, re return back to Earth safely. Dragon, nose cone secure for entry. Endeavor copies, nose cone secured.
Endeavour, SpaceX for entry brief. Endeavour for entry brief. Shane, things are looking really good. No deltas to timeline. Vehicle is nominal. We're tracking no issues for entry. Entry targeting is also nominal. Note that you may see the landing site slightly off in the world view. That is expected and nominal due to the entry purge, and uh, entry guidance will clean that up, so that's nominal. There's no delta as to weather. The recovery fast boats have been launched, and they're awaiting arrival. I'll copy. Great news all around. Thanks, Chris, and uh, we copy all. We copy. Thank you. Further affirmation that everything continues to look good. Uh, we did have a successful deorbit burn, and so we're just really in a waiting period right now be before we begin that entry uh, coming up in approximately 10 minutes uh, when the crew themselves will enter into the Earth's atmosphere uh, and uh, the heat shield being pointed in the right direction. Uh, and the vehicle itself will slow down uh, over the course of about seven minutes uh, until they get on the other side into the Earth's atmosphere and we can talk to them again, uh, slowing down from 17,000 miles an hour to about 350 miles an hour. That briefing was spectacular, Andy. Uh, it sounds like the weather is cooperating um, and all of the recovery teams are in place. In fact, the fast boats that we were talking about earlier have already deployed. Uh, we are getting ready uh, to bring these guys home. Yeah, there are really no changes in uh, what uh, we were expecting or yep. what we heard prior to the deorbit sequence. So uh, in that sense, everything was great leading up to the deorbit sequence, and everything remains great right now for uh, cruise splashdown and recovery. So again, uh, we've been hearing nothing but good news, uh, <laughs> all broadcasts. Uh, we are about five minutes away from slewing right. of the dragon to orient it correctly, mm -hmm. uh, and then a few minutes after that from... Um, uh, anticipated loss of signal. Again, that communications blackout period due to the plasma buildup uh, around the Dragon capsule. So a lot's going to happen. Let's go through the uh, sequence of events here while we have a little bit of time uh, as we're waiting for that slew, of course, and then, of course, the, the uh, entry sequence itself. Um, once the Dragon slews or orients itself right in the precise position where the um, heat shield is pointed in the right direction, uh, Andy, as you mentioned, we're going to enter into a period uh, where we will lose the signal, uh, and that's just because of the plasma that's building up on the outside of the spacecraft. Communications can't get through, so... Uh, uh, the plasma is building up because we are using the atmosphere itself to slow us down. We're going about 17,000 uh, miles an hour now, and we need to slow down um, uh, quite a bit uh, eventually to get us to about 15 miles an hour. So the bulk of that will happen uh, during the entry into Earth's atmosphere. It'll, it'll shave off from 17,000 miles an hour to about 350 miles an hour. Uh, from there, there will be a sequence of parachute deployments, first with the drogue chute, uh, that'll perform the initial slowdown from 350 miles an hour to, I think it was, you said, uh, about 120 miles an hour. And then from there, it's only a matter of seconds, about 40 seconds after drogue chute deploy, that those will be uh, cut off and the four main parachutes will deploy uh, from the Dragon itself, slowing it down to about 15 miles an hour. We are aiming right on time for a glass-like, uh, I, I, we've heard lake, I've, I've heard the word pool. Uh, um, uh, wave conditions the out at Pensacola, Florida look absolutely pristine. So, so things are looking pretty good for us so far. So after splashdown, we just heard that the fast boats are on their way to yep. the recovery site. Um, there are two of them. Uh, the first uh, fast boat will um, approach the Dragon capsule that's in the water and do a couple of things. Uh, really, uh, a lot of safety checks to make sure there isn't any ordinances or um, uh, any type of um, 
uh, chemicals in the air. They'll also do a vehicle integrity check to make sure things are looking great on the vehicle and then give the go for um, the rest of the recovery team to approach the vehicle. The other recovery vessel, um, as long as that first fast boat um, uh, is, is uh, able to do its job, um, the other uh, fast boat will go ahead and recover the main chute that's in the water. Um, if uh, that first fast boat, for whatever reason, motor failure, uh, uh, who, who knows, um, cannot do their job, it serves as a redundant uh, vehicle. From there, um, a, um, a rigger who uh, typically uh, approaches the vehicle on a jet ski will uh, approach the vehicle and actually physically climb up on top of the Dragon capsule. Uh, they carry with them a lot of hardware, a lot of hoisting equipment that they'll need to attach to the capsule. And this is really to prepare the vehicle to be, again, lifted out of the water. There is a larger rec recovery vessel that has a, um, a, a sort of hoisting a, a crane of, of sorts on the back of it, and there's a platform or nest um, that the uh, recovery vessel will uh, hoist the, the dragon capsule out of the water, place it on the nest, secure it in place. From there, a couple more checks will, will happen, and then we can uh, finally get to see the crew egress uh, the dragon capsule. That's right. The nest itself moves a little bit further Dragon's in. SpaceX for crew entry preparations. Hey, SpaceX, our tablets are secure. The train to Titan visors are down. We copy all. Thank you. Approximately four minutes, three zero seconds until anticipated calm blackout. We'll see you on the other side at 0326. Copy 0326. Talk to you then. Four minutes, three zero seconds takes us to 720. Uh, right on the money, 7.20 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 8.20 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so that's uh, the calm blackout that we were talking about. It's a seven-minute period where uh, we're really in the atmosphere at that point. The heat shield is doing its job of dissipating the 3,500 degrees of heat that's surrounding the vehicle at that time and slowing the vehicle down down to uh, 350 miles an hour. So, so everything is happening right on cue. 7.20 p.m. is when we're expecting that loss of signal. It is an estimate, um, so there might be a variation of a couple of seconds, couple of minutes. We'll stand by for that seven minute period. Uh, so we'll be looking at uh, approximately 720 uh, to 727. Yeah, and again, as we get closer to the end of the blackout communications period, we will be, we, we typically hear um, the either Dragon or Ground pinging each other to make sure um, that they do have signal acquisition. So um, again, seven minutes um, and, and we'll be with you uh, the entire way uh, for signal acquisition. Uh, shortly after that, the drove chutes will deploy. That, that happens at about 18,000 feet. Um, and then at 6,500 feet, that's when the main chutes deploy. So we, we talked about um, uh, deployment in terms of speed, right. uh, but um, uh, there are sensors on the Dragon vehicle that detect both velocity and pressure, and they, they know basically exactly when to deploy. Um, so again, the Dragon vehicle, super intelligent and uh, uh, basically pilots itself. Um, that's why even through this blackout period, um, the Dragon knows where it's at, it knows where it needs to go. Uh, so the crew is, is in good hands. An automatic flight all the way. It really started uh, about eight hours ago. Uh, when the uh, Dragon itself, uh, more than eight hours ago at this point, undocked from the International Space Station, the Zenith port, uh, and backed up to about 220 meters, an automatic procedure, uh, followed by an automatic fly around. In fact, the crew were really hands off throughout that whole period. Uh, the commander, uh, Shane Kimbrough, and pilot Megan MacArthur were in their seats monitoring the entire procedure while Tomoth Eskay was at the forward window that was pointed right at the International Space Station, taking pictures for about an hour and a half as it uh, circled the International Space Station. We got awesome pictures of the International Space Station. I'm anticipating, I haven't seen them yet, but uh, we, I'm definitely looking forward to them. Uh, all of that was automatic. Uh, and then of course the departure burns that got us to break away from the keep out sphere and the approach ellipsoid uh, that surround the International Space Station and get us into uh, 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 
lower altitude, about 10 kilometers below the station, which we were at for quite some time, uh, followed by the departure phase burn. Uh, we had a good trunk jettison, claw, or claw separation trunk jettison, and then, of course, the super important deorbit burn, all right on time. Uh, this has been a fantastic flight so far. So we are just 25 minutes away from splashdown. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, we are entering, going to be entering that black of communications period. But uh, once we're on the other side, so to speak, of that, things happen very, very quickly. Drogue shoots deploy, main shoots deploy, and we're in the water just a few minutes later. And you mentioned, Gary, um, the WB-57 is right. up in the air. It is equipped with um, uh, imaging technology that will be able to get pretty much the first views of the Dragon capsule uh, on its return back to Earth. So we do expect to see uh, that great footage here in a couple minutes as well. We're about 30 seconds from the anticipated loss of signal. Uh, this is really the beginning of a seven minute period where the crew themselves will be, okay, we're, and we're hearing from the Dragon teams here in Mission Control Hawthorne, they're starting to see some drag. So we are now making contact with the upper limits of the atmosphere right now. That's gonna be uh, slowing the vehicle down quite a bit. Now seconds away from the anticipated loss of signal. So we're in the expected period now. That was uh, the anticipated loss of signal. So, so the clock starts uh, approximately now uh, until about 7.27 p.m. Pacific, 10.27 p.m. Eastern. Uh, now in the blackout and entry period. And we did hear that, uh, we did hear some initial confirmation from the Dragon teams here. They're starting to see some drag. Um, so uh, we'll see the vehicle slow down here quite a bit. During this re-entry phase, the team is going to be experiencing um, deceleration. Uh, right now, they're going through that, uh, as well as when the parachutes deploy. Uh, the seats actually will rotate themselves to about 26 degrees to make sure that the crew is oriented properly for when um, the, the chutes deploy. So uh, the, the, um, during the downhill phase, uh, very similar uh, G-forces experience, about 3.5 uh, to maybe anywhere uh, to like 4.5 Gs. Right. Um, so uh, uh, the crew is, is definitely going to be anticipating that, and that's, that's definitely part of their training and, and knowledge. So we're standing by. Uh, we did. Uh, we are in the blackout period right now. Uh, this blackout period expected to last an additional six or so minutes uh, until we hear some of the first calls from the crew inside Dragon, now slowing down from 17,000 miles an hour to about 350 miles an hour when we hear them on the other side of this blackout period. Again, we have a WB-57 high altitude aircraft that has deployed with an imaging system on board to, to get those initial views using infrared cameras that are on board. So even though it is nighttime, uh, as long as the vehicle is able to identify and track the vehicle, which with the infrared camera will be easy. Just look for the hot thing that just came from the uh, uh, from the atmosphere. Uh, it'll be able to get those initial views and uh, confirmation of the status of the vehicle, the very first confirmation, which is very critical to the teams monitoring the operations. And of course, the recovery teams that are out in the Gulf right now, fast boats have been deployed. So we got confirmation of that. Uh, the helicopters have landed on the Go Navigator uh, recovery vessel and the teams are on the vessel right now uh, getting ready to uh, welcome the crew on board once the uh, fast boats get out to the capsule and rig it with some of the equipment that's necessary to hoist it on board using the A-frame on the Go Navigator spacecraft. Uh, we are really in the critical
period right now, just uh, eagerly awaiting, I think all of the teams are, uh, the comms uh, at the end uh, when we have an acquisition of signal from the crew uh, and some of the first views of the spacecraft itself and uh, confirmation of the next sequence of automatic events, which are the deployment of the parachutes. Yeah, and the Earth's atmosphere certainly does make it easier for the WB-57 to spot the hot thing. It is uh, uh, excess <laughs> of 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, so right. it should be able to spot it in the sky. There should be nothing else like it right. uh, at this time. Uh, we're, again, a couple of minutes away from um, starting to exit that uh, phase where we're, we're seeing a lot of plasma, and so uh, we are expecting um, pings uh, from the Dragon or ground uh, to try to get that acquisition of signal. So again, uh, I mentioned uh, things are going to be happening very, very quickly as soon as we get out of here. Gary, we are under 10 minutes until splashdown. <laughs> I cannot wait. Uh, this is a very uh, dynamic period, so we are listening very closely uh, to all of the different sequence of events because as you're saying, Andy, a lot is going to happen. We're more than halfway through this uh, expected blackout period, uh, an expected seven minute period. Of course, there might be some variation, but uh, we're expecting an acquisition of signal and initial communications from the crew uh, before we see uh, uh, the deployment of the drogue parachutes and and, uh, and main parachutes. There's about uh, maybe about two minutes difference from when we should first hear from the crew themselves at about 727 and about 729 p.m. Pacific is when uh, we should see the uh, drogues and the main chutes deploy. And again, I say both of them at 729 because that's how fast that sequence is. Um, it's about uh, eight second deployment from uh, of confirmation of the drogue shoots themselves. And 40 seconds later, the, shoot, the main shoots are out. It's very, very quick. Really, any any minute now, we are expecting um, anticipated acquisition of signal uh, to reconnect that communications line between uh, the spacecraft and uh, the folks here on the ground at Earth. From this moment in time, about a minute left in the anticipated period. Again, it's not it's not an exact science. Um, there might be some variation. We might hear from them early. We might hear from them late. It just depends on a couple of different factors. Uh, but we're all eagerly at the edge of our seats right now, just uh, standing by, waiting to hear from the crew. So far, things looking good. And we'll continue to track it as we enter the final moments of this blackout period. We're getting WB views. The first views of Crew Dragon. Look at that tail. That's the 3,500 degrees. Yes. Look, look for the hot thing, right? It is the hottest thing in the sky right now. Uh, that is such a, it's, it's literally lighting up the Endeavor, sky. Endeavor, SpaceX, come check. Beautiful, beautiful. And Dragon, we've got you. Expect automated parachute deployment, and we have you on visual. Automated shoots. Wonderful to hear from the crew on the other side of the blackout period, the WB-57 high-altitude aircraft providing that thermal imaging. We saw the tail of the entry of the vehicle itself. Absolutely Dragon, beautiful. GPS converge. Expect nominal altitude for drogues. Copy GPS, nominal altitude. So again, nominal altitude for drogue deployment. That happens at about 18,000 feet. Uh, again, good news after good news, Gary. Uh, things are looking great for crew to return. I am loving this flight. That uh, that altitude expected one minute from now.
right as anticipated, Andy. Dragon, brace for drug window. We're braced. The thermal imaging system on board the WB-57 is getting us great views of the capsule, but should give us equally good views of the drogue deployment expected seconds from now. The capsule is traveling about 350 miles an hour. And the drogue chute's job is to slow it down to about 120. Drogues deployed. Confirmation. That'll slow us down from 350 miles an hour to 120 miles an hour. Dragon, video on two healthy drogues. Does that rate nominal? Copy, great news. So in about 30 seconds, the main chutes are going to come out. There are four of them, and they deploy at about 6,500 feet. Oh, Gary, look at this. This is an excellent view of the drogue uh, parachutes. There it is. Drogue separation, main chute deploy. We'll wait for confirmation of four healthy mains. You really can't ask for anything better. We got confirmation of, uh, you heard on the loops there, four healthy mains. Descent rate is nominal. That means we are expecting splashdown three minutes from now. Visually, you can see one of the mains uh, taking a slightly longer to inflate. But the teams are, uh, are tracking that as a nominal inflation rate, uh, and the descent rate is as expected. We do have four healthy mains, and we are expe expecting an on-time splashdown. Copy six. Six hundred meters. This is a better shot of those four healthy main parachutes attached to the Dragon spacecraft Endeavor as it continues to descend. Four hundred meters. The rate is as expected, 400 meters from splashdown. Three hundred meters. Two hundred meters brace. We copy two hundred embracing. Standing by for confirmation of splashdown. Space 
copy. We heard the name. Endeavor, on behalf of SpaceX, welcome home to planet Earth. Hey, Chris. It's great to be back to planet Earth. Thanks to SAE and Jackson teams. Uh, it was an honor to represent you and work with your family. Look forward to seeing you soon. Splashdown confirmed at 7.33 p.m. Pacific, 10.33 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Four astronauts of Crew 2, Shane Kimbrough, Megan MacArthur, Aki Hoshide, and Toma Pesquet now safely returned to Earth. Confirmation that the main parachutes have been cut, and you can see from a thermal imaging camera that the fast boats are already on their way to meet up with Crew Dragon Endeavor. Now splashing down off the coast of Florida for the second time. Three, we think we're... Hey Shane, you're coming in broken, but we see stable one. Copy, great news. Stable one is the configuration that we were hoping for. Stable one means it's in the ocean upright and as expected. So the teams have been uh, ready and waiting about three nautical miles away. And Dragon, please repeat. Yeah, we're going to raise our visors if you got that. Hey, go for visor raise. So it looks like the astronauts inside are going to be lifting those visors. Uh, the recovery team has been uh, waiting about three nautical miles away. So it is going to take them a little bit of time to make their way to Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma inside of Dragon. Uh, quick rundown of what is to come. Um, so about a minute and a half after a splashdown, uh, Mission Control here in Hawthorne will give the go for safe approach. About two minutes away, uh, two minutes from uh, splashdown, the approach boat begins its inspection. Uh, we are expecting that um, ordinance and hypercall check to complete around the L plus 12 minute mark, around the L plus 30 minute mark. Dragon, SpaceX, come check. Endeavor has you loud and clear, SpaceX. We have you loud and clear as well. We stopped the boat. We have it much better now. So some good comms checks uh, on screen right now. That is the Dragon capsule in the background, uh, upright and stable in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, and uh, there's a boat that is heading towards it. So um, at about L plus 30 minutes, uh, the Dragon rigging will be, is expected to complete. Again, rigging is where um, a, a, an employee as part of the recovery team will physically climb on top of Dragon and attach hardware necessary to hoist Dragon up and out of the water. Recovery ships um, also arrive at this time um, at L plus 38 minutes. Uh, that's when we're expecting to lift Dragon out of the water. Uh, L plus 40 minutes, Dragon will be on deck of the recovery vessel. And then at L plus 48 minutes, we are expecting Dragon hatch to open and the crew to egress after about six months uh, in space. That is the goal, to do this in under an hour, and it seems like the, the crew is right where they're supposed to be, right on time. We're getting thermal images of uh, the uh, fast boats out near the Crew Dragon Endeavor in the uh, wonderfully smooth waters of the Gulf of Mexico as predicted, which is fantastic. Um, you can see there's two boats that are out towards the recovery vessel once we uh, get a, a smoother lock on the vehicle itself. One of them collecting the parachutes, uh, the other uh, doing some of the rigging that you were talking about, Andy, which is uh, super critical to the next series of steps. Um, Dragon, the SpaceX is go for recovery personnel to approach. Expect personnel alongside momentarily. Okay, cut it out, we're ready.
So we should see one of the fast boats go out really right next to the capsule. And uh, Andy, you were describing this a little bit earlier. We'll see um, some personnel climb on board. Um, that rigging equipment is hardware that they have on board and they have to attach certain things to certain areas um, because the recovery vessel itself, the Go Navigator, uh, is also moving out to- Join in, SpaceX request permission to come on board via display cam only. You're welcome on board on the display cam, SpaceX. We copy. Thanks, Shane. So the teams here in Mission Control, Hawthorne, will get a peek inside the vehicle itself, um, watching over their shoulder. The, the crew themselves really uh, are just in a waiting position. Um, their seats were rotated uh, for shoot deployment and for splashdown. Uh, so they're in a slightly more upright position, although they're not completely upright. It just helps to help them to brace. Uh, you heard that a couple of times over the drag and the ground calls, brace for those shoot deployments and for the splashdown itself. Uh, but really they're in just a waiting posture at this point as the uh, recovery teams do their job. It'll take the Go Navigator recovery vessel, which we're getting some of the images from right now, um, the thermal images. Uh, it, it takes it quite a bit to get out to the capsule itself, about 30 minutes, but, which is why we have the fast boats. The fast boats doing a lot of the uh, work ahead of time to prepare it so that really when the Go Navigator arrives right next to the spacecraft, it is ready to hoist onto the recovery vessel and onto the Dragon Nest. You can see that each of the boats are outfitted with uh, spotlights to make sure that they can, again, do all of their functions uh, properly as it, this is a nighttime recovery out on the East Coast. But it looks like they have plenty of lighting. And this is the second time that this particular capsule has landed. Right. Um, so this, this capsule Endeavor was used as part of the Demonstration 2 mission last year, uh, flying Bob and Doug, and it has splashed down and been recovered once before. So uh, this is not its first rodeo. Really a testament to uh, the capability of these American spacecraft that are rotating crews to and from the International Space Station as part of these expeditions. It is truly an international team. From the camera views that you're seeing right now uh, on board the GO Navigator is uh, teams representing NASA, SpaceX, European Space Agency, and the Japanese uh, Exploration, uh, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, all of them on board. Uh, truly an international uh, government and commercial joint effort to make something like this possible. So this is this is the um, first fast boat. Um, right now, it is uh, it's essentially doing safety checks, uh, making sure that ordinances and hypergalls are uh, still not persisting in the area immediately around the vehicle. Um, they're also uh, doing um, essentially a an inspection of the capsule itself to make sure that it, integrity-wise, it is good uh, before we start to. Um, again, rig the equipments for hoisting later on tonight. So again, it's it's going to take some time. We're shooting for less than an hour to bring the Dragon uh, Endeavor onto the recovery ship and to uh, open up the hatches and egress the crew or take them out and bring them onto the medical facilities. I can only imagine the views that were possible from right there in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, let's see, we do have a call in from Leah Cheshire, uh, NASA Communications, who's on the Go Navigator recovery ship and was able to uh, witness the re-entry and splashdown of Crew Dragon Endeavor. Leah, if you can hear me, tell us about your experience 
very incident, uh, witnessing Dragon Endeavor splash down, uh, bringing a crew home from the International Space Station for the second time. Gary, I can only... I can hardly explain how amazing this experience has been. Right now, as you said, I'm on Go Navigator. Right now, I'm at the mountain. Looking forward to the fast boat, fast boat, fast boat, boat, boat towards the spacecraft. Um, we were standing on top of the helipad where we just landed at about 9 p.m. Central, or 9 p.m. Eastern time. And we stood back at the helipad watching the crew members streak through the atmosphere. It truly looked like a meteor, and actually at the exact same time we saw it in the crew members, we did see a meteorite in the sky. So it was an incredible moment, um, and I was standing next to NASA astronaut Shannon Walker, who she herself just completed this journey six or seven months ago as a member of the Crew-1 uh, spacecraft and mission, and so it, it, it's been an incredible night here on Go Navigator. We can't ask for better conditions. It's uh, wonderful temperatures. The sea is very smooth and, and glassy almost. And so uh, things are just moving really smoothly here, and teams are, are executing everything necessary on the board. Leah, tell me what's uh, happening uh, as you are witnessing it. Uh, you, you mentioned landing uh, uh, not too long ago, about an hour and a half ago, on the recovery ship. Tell me what the teams have been doing. We, we witnessed the back end of that with the recovery boats deployed. Uh, what's been happening in preparation from your perspective uh, to get ready for this moment? We saw the fast boats and a jet ski pull up next to us, uh, pretty near us, as we waited for the capsule to re-enter the water. And I actually have a very good vision of the capsule right now. Um, and since that time, there have been several people on the ship, um, just making sure that all of the hydraulics and everything are ready to go to lift Crew Dragon up into uh, the nest that is on the ship. And you'll see that as it pulls for the platform that they will egress. Uh, they'll then move into medical checks. So teams, all the team members here on the boat are uh, a couple update. of flights tonight on the helicopters, and uh, they're ready to jump in. Go ahead for status update. Tropical sweeps and unfired ordnance checks are nominal. Rigging is in progress. Approximately two five minutes until capsule lift. Stand by for a PMC as our next step. Copy two five minutes before lift and standing by for PMC. All right, we're hearing private medical conference coming and up. Maybe we can uh, hold for a minute if you'd like, uh, just to finish the uh, set phone ops if you'd like. Sounds good. I will call you back in one minute. All right, and we're hearing those uh, the, the crew sounding healthy from, from inside Crew Dragon Endeavor, walking through the final steps, getting a private medical conference. Leah, one more question before we let you go and, and uh, witness some of the next uh, series of events. Uh, of course, we're going to be following all along the way, but after the crew uh, enters into the uh, um, GO Navigator vessel and, and does those medical checks, what are the next steps to get the crew uh, home, uh, either in Houston or in the United European Space Agency. It is an incredibly excellent process. Uh, so the crew members, after they've completed those medical checks, they will board a helicopter right here on the boat uh, within just a couple of hours of splashing down. And once that takes off, uh, they will board a NASA jet, which will take the back back to their respective hometowns, especially those families that have been off and their mission on the International Space Station. Uh, everything is moving on. All right, you know, wait to have it. Leah Cheshire, NASA Communications, thank you for joining us and, and telling us a little bit about uh, what's happening there at the recovery site. Best of luck to you.
right, that was Leah Cheshire on board the uh, Go Navigator recovery vessel now heading back uh, to inside the Crew Dragon. We're getting those views right over the shoulder. The crew standing by, helmet visors up, uh, really just in a waiting posture as we're uh, uh, waiting for the fast boats and the teams out there to rig the Crew Dragon Endeavor with the proper equipment to hoist it, the capsule itself up onto the Go Navigator spacecraft where you just heard uh, Leah Cheshire and the uh, remaining recovery teams uh, are waiting uh, for, of course, the series of medical checks and, and of course, the personnel representing each of the space agencies, NASA, uh, European Space Agency, JAXA, as well as SpaceX. So again, as expected, Crew Dragon Endeavor splashing down off the coast of Pensacola, Florida, right on time, 7.33 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.33 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. An incredible journey. We got a fly around of the International Space Station documenting the exterior of the orbiting complex with digital photographs. Uh, the first time we've done that since 2018 with a Soyuz survey uh, that was done. A lot of elements of the space station have been added since, so we'll be able to document that and check on the status of areas that can't normally be seen by some of the exterior cameras, uh, as well as the robotic arm. You see, we are getting uh, views from inside Capsule Endeavor. Uh, the crew really just poised, seated, uh, with their seats rotated slightly upright. You can see they still have uh, access Try to some of the panels. For status update. Go ahead. Let's turn around and make it its final approach to you. Just a couple hundred meters off. Just checking in to see if ready for that PMC. We are ready for the PMC. All right, and work. Uh, next person you hear from should be a no. So we just got updates that the recovery vessel is uh, just a couple hundred meters away from the Dragon capsule, um, and they are gearing up for the PMC, which stands for Private Medical Conference. The flight surgeon uh, will check in with each of the crew members to make sure um, uh, they are doing well, uh, as they uh, have just returned back to Earth after 199 days in space. Um, Right now, this is a view of the backside of the recovery vessel. Um, that is essentially a crane. Uh, the bottom middle section is the platform or nest where the dragon will be hoisted up and placed upon. And that platform actually will move um, towards the center of the boat uh, into essentially a platform where the astronauts can uh, step off of. And so. Um, Again, the, the, the boat is, is backing up towards the Dragon Cap, so you can see it in the background there, and um, it'll uh, uh, hook up all of its lines to the rigging equipment that the rigger is currently attaching on the spacecraft, and uh, we'll hoist it up and get it on top of the recovery vessel. We are not too far away from the Dragon spacecraft. It's right off of the aft end of the recovery vessel itself. So right as expected, it was about a, it was expected to be a 30 minute okay, transit. SpaceX, I'm back with you. 
Yeah, about a 30 minute transit Copy and uh, they got there in 20. I think a big part of of this is you look at the seas right now and uh, there's effectively no movement, Gary. Uh, Leah described it, uh, uh, witnessing it firsthand. It is glass-like, pristine, yeah. um, which makes really for the recovery operations uh, just that much uh, easier. Really one of the very critical reasons why we are in an indirect handover posture. Again, the Crew-2 astronauts landing in the Gulf of Mexico before Crew-3 launched, it was really for, for this reason. It was because uh, the weather at this moment in time was predicted uh, to be as smooth and uh, uh, as fantastic as the uh, weather predictions forecasted. So again, the uh, crew is um, had a private medical conference that was uh, an initial assessment before uh, the docs on board have access to pull them out of the spacecraft. They have a pretty good idea of what to expect whenever they pull them out, so they'll, they'll know the uh, the right uh, pr um, uh, precautions to take and what's needed for each individual crew member. That, of course, privatized because of the medical uh, reasons. Um, but. Uh, that is why we have medical personnel on board the recovery spacecraft, medical facilities on, on board, uh, I'm sorry, not the recovery spacecraft, the recovery vessel, and med medical facilities there as well. Uh, and of course, it'll be a time for the docs to do those initial checks uh, before they, uh, what's anticipated, will fly each of the crew members out on a helo uh, back to um, back to shore where there are planes staged for them to bring them back home. It's not going to be a very long transit at all until we have some crew members uh, back home. Uh, Shane, um, Kimbrough, Megan MacArthur, Aki Hoshide all uh, planned to go on a NASA plane back to Houston. They'll land in Ellington Field, uh, not too far away from the Johnson Space Center there, uh, where they'll get to meet up with their family and friends, of course. Uh, Thomas Pesquet will board a separate plane and head over to Europe uh, for the facilities over at the European Space Agency to do something similar. So we're continuing to provide coverage, uh, even though the Crew Dragon and the and the crew inside have splashed down safely in the Gulf of Mexico at uh, right on time, 7.33 p.m. Pacific, 10.33 p.m. Eastern. We'll continue to provide coverage until they egress or exit from the spacecraft itself. And once all four crew members are on board, uh, we're expecting to get some calls from representatives of each of the space agencies of the astronauts that are on board, Crew Dragon Endeavor now. now JAXA and ESA all calling in to provide some remarks after a successful mission and return of all four crew members back to planet Earth. This here is a live view inside of the Dragon capsule. The crew members are uh, inside, and, and really, Gary, as you mentioned, they are just uh, waiting for the recovery team to do their job, uh, hoist the Dragon out of the water uh, before they can egress the vehicle. From this view inside Crew Dragon Endeavor, over on the right side, Megan MacArthur, the pilot for the Crew-2 mission, you can see that little black antenna sticking out from her seat. She's on a satellite phone right now talking with the uh, teams over in Mission Control Houston, getting confirmation that everyone's saying hi to the crew, checking in. Sounds like they're doing very well.
if you remember back in uh, the Demo 2 mission, it was a test mission for we're using Crew Dragon Endeavor, but really to verify that the uh, SpaceX Crew Dragon was ready to carry crews as part of regular crew rotation missions to and from the International Space Station. As part of that, they used the satellite phone uh, as one of the checks and measures to ensure that the crew had the capability to use the satellite phone uh, to call the various teams and report statuses. Uh, it was um, uh, really a precaution and one of the test objectives of uh, the mission itself. Now continuing that uh, here on Crew 2. And now the recovery vessel is that much closer to the Dragon capsule. Dragon, SpaceX for status update. Go ahead, SpaceX. Breaking is complete, or approximately five minutes until capsule lift. Copy. see the person that is on the capsule itself. That is the rigger. They, uh, we just got confirmation that the rigging has been completed. Uh, now they are uh, essentially um, securing the, the Dragon capsule to all of the rigging hardware that was attached to safely lift it up and out of the water and onto the recovery vessel. We're seeing motion of the A-frame now getting into position. The rigger making the final attachments necessary memory serves me right from previous recovery missions, the rigger will uh, jump off the capsule into the water uh, and make his way back into the recovery or, or into one of the fast boats after uh, he's done with this work. Dragon, SpaceX, brace for capsule lift. Copy, brace. There he goes, as expected, jumped into the water. His job complete, attaching the uh, all of the connection points to Crew Dragon Endeavor, making sure that it is stable as the A-frame itself, using hydraulic lifts, hoists Crew Dragon Endeavor out of the water onto that circular frame there you see at the base of uh, the ship. That is the Dragon Nest. And Gary, we are uh, 
in a in, in a slightly we're slightly ahead of schedule. We were expecting Dragon uh, Lift to begin at L plus 38 minutes. It is L plus 30 minutes now. Uh, so things can, things continuing to go smoothly as part of Crew 2's uh, return and recovery. Seem to get better and more efficient with each <laughs> mission. Dragon, welcome aboard the recovery vessel. Personnel completing file checks. Stand by for translation to the egress platform. Copy, glad to ready for translation. All right, with that, we have confirmation that uh, Crew Dragon Endeavor is on the Dragon Nest. It has been hoisted from the Gulf of Mexico and put onto the recovery ship where you saw the dragon be gently placed is called the dragon nest. That whole section of the ship will be uh, translated or moved in uh, further into the ship uh, to allow access to the side hatch. That'll be the next uh, very important critical series of steps. There's personnel there that will um, work on the hatch to eventually open it. It'll be open for the first time in 199 days. Uh, and we'll get the first uh, glimpses of the crew inside. We should be able to witness the egress operations as well, each of the crew members getting out as long as the feeds permit. So we can welcome each of them inside. So for, this, for those of you just joining us, the Dragon capsule has been lifted up and out of the water and is on the recovery vessel. Uh, we just saw a few shots of the crew on board the ship. Uh, what they're doing is uh, securing the Dragon onto the ship to make sure it doesn't move as, it, again, it's being translated or, or moved towards the egress platform uh, where the uh, side hatch will be opened and the crew inside uh, can uh, egress the vehicle. 
the shot you see on screen right now is a view inside. It's a live shot of the of inside the capsule. On on the left hand side, that is uh, Commander Shane Kimbrough, and to the right of him is Pilot Megan MacArthur. Uh, what you don't see on screen uh, is to the right of Megan MacArthur is Mission Specialist Thomas Pesquet. Uh, and uh, to the left of Shane Kimbrough is Mission Specialist Aki Hoshide. They've had about an eight hour journey from undocking from the International Space Station, and now they're on the Dragon, recovery vessel. Stand by for translation to egress platform. Copy, we're ready. There's that translation. Still getting views from inside Crew Dragon Endeavor. This is spectacular. We're less than 40 minutes after the Dragon itself splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico for the second time. Uh, now, just again, less than 40 minutes later, the crew has been hoisted onto the recovery ship, uh, and the Dragon nest itself has been translated over to the egress platform. Uh, the next series of steps will be uh, personnel on the recovery vessel. Uh, that are specialized in opening up that side hatch uh, will do so. We have medical doctors on board that will uh, take care of them after that. They'll provide initial uh, medical care and assessment, uh, egressing the crew from uh, outside the Dragon and putting them into medical facilities that are on board to conduct a series of initial checks uh, before they are flown by helicopter back to shore. The recovery vessel takes uh, quite a bit of time to get back to shore, so they'll be flown. Uh, so they can get right on an aircraft and fly home uh, within a very short period of time. Again, we're going to provide continuous coverage until all crew members have egressed the vehicle. We also have representatives of NASA, JAXA, and ESA uh, that are scheduled to be on the line to provide a comments of a successful mission after the crew successfully splashed down, egressed, and are safe on board the recovery vessel. Dragon, stand by for side hatch opening and egress. Next call will be from the recovery team. Crew 2, congratulations. Push control, send it off. Hey, thanks again, Chris, to you and your team. We'll see you guys soon. Side hatch is open. You see the waves coming out.
even from inside Dragon now, we're seeing some of the recovery personnel. The first humans that these crew members have seen on planet Earth uh, for 199 days. So I believe the recovery team is checking in with the crews to make sure uh, they're all uh, doing fine. There are, uh, we actually have to remove the footrest underneath the seats um, prior to the crew getting out. It just makes it a little bit easier um, for them to egress the vehicle with that out of the way. We're on a great timeline right now, just 40 minutes uh, after splashing down in the Gulf of Mexico. The side hatch is open, and there are uh, teams inside Crew Dragon Endeavor. That is a pretty quick recovery, not bad. Oh, this is Five a views footage. inside Endeavor. Wonderful. Getting all four crew members. Thumbs up. They are feeling good. Live streams from on the recovery boat. Spectacular. You can see some more of the footrests are coming out of the vehicle. And once all of those are removed, we are expecting the crew to egress one at a time.
So if you are just joining us, uh, left-hand side of the screen, that is the view from inside of the Dragon capsule. Uh, it has been uh, recovered out of the water and is currently on the recovery vessel. Uh, the side hatch is open, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. The recovery team uh, are continuing to um, do some more checkouts and procedures before uh, we start to see the Crew 2 astronauts egress the Dragon capsule. Still standing by for uh, the egress of the four astronauts of Crew 2. Outside of Crew Dragon Endeavor, you can see uh, stationed over to the left there is a stretcher, part of the nominal procedure. Uh, once they are egressed from uh, the vehicle, they'll be put into uh, the stretcher and, and taken over to medical facilities. This is uh, a standard precaution that's been exercised uh, for each of the crew recovery missions so far. First crew member being egressed from Crew Dragon Endeavor, 
think I witnessed some applause there from some of the recovery personnel as well. It's hard to tell uh, which crew member that was. And we got confirmation that was Megan MacArthur. Uh, that was the pilot of the Crew 2 mission, the first crew member egressed from inside Crew Dragon Endeavor. Next out is uh, Commander Shane Kimbrough, outside of Crew Dragon Endeavor, being translated over to the stretcher per nominal procedure, waves, smiles on his face, a fantastic journey, 199 days in space, splashing down on time.
here comes the third member to egress the capsule. This is Aki Hoshide. Some fist bumps and smiles from Aki. Again, after 199 days in space, returning to Earth. All crew members flashing the peace sign for crew two. I love it. And that leaves one more member inside of Dragon. That is Thomas Pesquet of the European Space Agency. Here comes Toma. Oh. That's the ESA dock on board, checking in with uh, Toma Pesquet. There you go. Everybody flashing the crew too. Yes, I love it. Yes. Fist, Fist bumps, bumps, high fives. High fives for, pos <laughs> for posterity. So that is all four members of the crew two team uh, safely uh, on a boat. I was going to say on land for a second, right. but they're on a boat. Uh, and they will um, uh, head to the, all their respective um, uh, places they need to go. But uh, what a great uh, recovery. We, we, we talked about how things were going to speed up um, and, and get more exciting. And that recovery was one of the fastest I've ever seen. It, it was spectacular. I mean, uh, you couldn't have asked for a better mission. Uh, we accomplished everything and everything on time. Undocking right at 11.05 uh, a.m. earlier today. We did a fly around of the International Space Station, went super smoothly, got some fantastic views, even on our coverage all along the way. Um, all of the burns performed as expected. We did have an out of plane burn as well that was introduced just to make sure we were on the right course, but it set us up right for that deorbit burn on time. And uh, lo and behold, as soon as we got out of that blackout period, uh, even a little bit before from the WB-57, that those views of the streak uh, that was yep. the plasma building up on the outside of the spacecraft, we saw that. Uh, we saw all the all great shoots, drogue shoots, main shoots, uh, all deploy with the infrared cameras uh, and land on a glassy Gulf of Mexico. The waves were, were perfect, no, uh, incredible wind speeds, and the recovery operations went super smooth. All in all, a fantastic mission. So we'll stand by. Uh, we're going to continue our coverage here for just a little bit. All of, uh, all of the crew members have uh, uh, egressed and are on the recovery uh, boats, but we're going to stand by. We're hoping to uh, hear from some representatives from each of the respective space agencies, NASA, ESA, and JAXA, uh, and we'll just stand by and uh, make a connection with them soon. Yeah, so it was great to see uh, all four members, again, despite uh, 199 days in space and coming back to Earth, uh, they came out of the capsule with smiles, thumbs <laughs> up, uh, fist bumps, and so they are definitely in good spirits, and that is always great to see.
So a little bit about what's to come. Um, so again, we'll continue our coverage and uh, hope to hear some remarks from some of the um, from the representatives of each of the space agencies. Uh, but right now, each of the four crew members are on the Go Navigator recovery vessel. They're going into some of the medical facilities that are on board, and they'll have doctors on board that are able to check them out and do an initial uh, medical assessment, making sure that they're good to go. They're not going to remain on Go Navigator for the entire trip back. They actually have helicopters that are staged, uh, ready to take them off. Uh, there's a helipad on the recovery vessel itself. Uh, so that helicopter will take them back over to shore where they have planes that are staged uh, at shore, ready to take them back to respective locations. For Shane, Megan, and Aki, they'll head back to uh, Houston. Uh, and they'll do some uh, additional medical assessments, some additional tests. They'll get to see their family. They'll get to go home. Uh, in just a couple of short days, they'll be working out. They'll be in the uh, um, they'll be in the gym, uh, getting reconditioned back to, for 1G for life on Earth. Tomat Pesquet will head over to Europe to do the same thing over at the facilities over at the European Space Agency, and that will be a wrap for the Crew 2 mission. Yeah, so they still have a little bit ways to go. Um... Uh, after egressing the, the Dragon capsule, but uh, it looks like uh, everything, again, going smoothly, um, especially as part of this broadcast. Again, you had mentioned, Gary, uh, everything that was on the to-do list today uh, has been done and has been done on time and, and very smoothly. Wonderful. So uh, we do have some representatives from uh, agencies online right now calling in uh, to make some comments on behalf of the agency. First, uh, we do have Kathy Leaders, uh, who is the Associate Administrator for Space Operations uh, here at NASA. Kathy, if you can hear me, uh, your initial thoughts now that uh, uh, Crew 2 has safely returned to Earth after 199 days and what it means to NASA as a space agency. Well, I'm always amazed that I can hold my breath for those last 10 minutes of reentry. You know, I mean, that is um, high drama right there. And like you mentioned several times, seeing those shoots come out is just an amazing thing. It is so nice to see the, that our SpaceX crew two astronauts are has safely splashed down in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Florida aboard the Crew Dragon Endeavor spacecraft, and we've now completed the agency's second long-duration commercial crew mission to the International Space Station. And what's it's been such a busy but exciting time aboard the station, and which is really our home in microgravity. You know, I'm so proud of the NASA and the SpaceX team for another successful return. They continue to show that amazing amount of dedication to each phase of the mission and, and just safely and methodically moving forward and conducting the mission. It's just amazing. You know, we originally were planning to launch our Crew 3 mission for a short overlap on station with Crew 2, but, you know, we ended up bringing Crew 2 home first. Um, the team really carefully balanced each decision. And as we looked at which was the safer opportunity, we decided to bring the crew home first, given the weather conditions. And as you can see tonight, they were great. Um, like people said, it was like a lake out there, a very calm lake. So this was a, the best decision we could have made, and it was just great to see the crew exit, exiting that spacecraft this evening. You know, as you folks have talked about, the mission set a record for the longest space flight by a U.S. crew spacecraft. The crew members were actually in their 200th flight day, um, even though they, and they did complete 199 full days in orbit, which surpassed the 168 days set by SpaceX's um, Crew-1 mission earlier this year. Not that any of those crew members count. <laughs> the Crew-2 mission, you know, launched April 23rd on a Falcon 9 rocket from NASA's Kennedy Space Center, and, uh, and then docked to the Harmony Module's forward port of the space station on April 24th, nearly 24 hours after liftoff. You know, the, the Crew-2 mission has traveled over 84 million miles during the mission while their stay on orbit and completed over 3,000 orbits around the Earth. And during their time on orbit, they have contributed to a host of science and maintenance activities, scientific investigations, technology demonstrations, and multiple public engagement efforts while aboarding the, um, on board the ISS vehicle. 
they've studied how gaseous flames behave in microgravity. And one of my favorites, as an ex-New Mexico person, grew hatched green chilies in the station's plant habitat facility and ate space tacos. They installed free-flying robotic assistants and even donned virtual reality goggles to test new methods of exercising in space, among many other scientific activities. And the astronauts took hundreds of pictures of Earth as part of the crew Earth observation investigation, which was one of the longest running investigations aboard the space station, which contributes to tracking of natural disasters and changes to our home planet. And most importantly, they did that fly around on the way home to have us check out the, the state of the ISS one more time. They conducted four spacewalks to install, deploy, and otherwise prepare for installation of our new ISS rollout solar arrays. And they also saw the arrival of seven spacecraft to the space station and seven spacecraft departing during their six-month stay. Station is the hub up there, our, our international hub. So this splashdown of Crew-2 comes just before the launch of NASA's SpaceX Crew 3 mission. I, the, the return looked spotless. I know folks will be wondering about the, that one lagging main parachute, and the team will be going off and, and looking at, um, you know, how the loading was on the chutes and understanding that behavior. It is behavior we've seen multiple times in other tests and usually happens when the lines kind of bunch up together until the aero forces kind of open up and, and spread the chutes. And the, the thing that makes me feel a little bit more confident is that the loading and the deceleration of the spacecraft all looked nominal for us, which is good news. But we're making this an exciting week for us. And, you know, one of the key things we'll be doing on our launch readiness review for the Crew-3 mission coming up, we'll be working through that. That launch readiness review is tomorrow at starting at 7 p.m. And uh, my uh, OCOM colleagues would, would be kicking me under the desk right now if I didn't tell everybody we'll be doing a post-launch readiness review press conference tomorrow evening at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time. So once again, thank you for watching. I can't tell you how excited I am to see all four of the crew members back on Earth, and I'm looking forward to launching another set of four this week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy Leaders, uh, Associate Administrator for Space Operations here at NASA. We also have on the line Hiroshi Sasaki, Vice President and Director General for the Human Spaceflight Technology Directorate at JAXA. Uh, Mr. Sasaki, your thoughts on the successful return and the completion of the Crew 2 mission? Thank you for the introductions. Uh, first of all, on behalf of JAXA, I'd like to express my heartfelt thanks to the NASA leadership, SpaceX, our international partners, ESA, CSA, Roscosmos, and all the colleagues who have devoted to the successful mission while overcoming the tough time under COVID-19. I'm really relieved that all the crew members came back home safely to us, and I do believe they have brought tremendous courage and hopes for all of us through this successful mission. Aki Hoshide served as a commander and led the Expedition 65 and 66 missions over five months. During his on-orbit stay succeeding astronaut Soichi Noguchi, Aki has completed his EVA with ESA astronaut Toma Pesuke and contributed to the upgrade of the ISS including the installs of MLM. Aki and the entire team faced various challenges during their stay, and they have overcome with great communication among the crew members and with ground team. It proves us again with the importance of teamwork and international cooperation. I'm also pleased that we JAXA along with Aki, have conducted various activities to promote space exploration, basic research, as well as commercialization of Lora's orbit. Every time 
we see a successful mission like this, we are getting one step closer to achieve our common goals towards space exploration using the gateway and on the lunar surface, and also bringing further benefits to Earth through the utilization of the ISS. Next fall, JAXA astronaut Koichi Wakata will be on board the Crew 5, followed by Satoshi Furukawa's long-stay mission in the coming years. I hope that the Aki's experience will be succeeded to contribute to our endeavors towards space exploration and human space flight. Once again, congratulations up to all of you the safe return and wishing the successful launch of Kudu 3. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Thank you so much. Hiroshi Sasaki, Vice President and Director General for the Human Spaceflight Technology Directed Directorate at JAXA. Uh, so that uh, will do it for us. That is the comments that we have from the respective agencies. Thank you so much for calling in and providing those comments. Well, now that Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma are safely back on planet Earth and getting checked out by NASA medical teams and, of course, teams from the respective international agencies, we are going to wrap up our live coverage of their historic return. This all kicked off on April 23rd, 2021 from historic launch pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. After a successful liftoff and separation from Falcon 9, Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma made a 24-hour flight on board Dragon to the International Space Station. Since arriving at the space station, they spent uh, nearly six months as members of Expedition 65 and 66 executing science experiments, spacewalks, and repairs while aboard the orbiting laboratory. And then their journey home began earlier today on the 8th when uh, they closed the hatch to Dragon and undock hours later at 11.05 a.m. Pacific time. After four successful departure burns and a phasing burn to line up their orbit, Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma rested for a few hours before waking up to prepare for re-entry this, uh, this evening. Uh, we, um, excuse me, they didn't rest. Uh, they, they went straight to uh, the- They had a meal. <laughs> they had a meal, basically, yeah. and donned their space. Uh, we then jettisoned the trunks, the Dragon's trunk, and performed our final on-orbit maneuver, the deorbit burn, at 6.39 p.m. Pacific time to send Dragon on the path home. The spacecraft re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and slowed its descent with successful deployments of two drogue parachutes and four mains, uh, with the final splashdown occurring off the coast of Pensacola, Florida, at 7.33 p.m. Pacific time. Now, following successful splashdown, we saw SpaceX recovery experts move in and prepare Dragon Endeavor for its lift off, uh, so for its lift onto the recovery vessel. And just a little less than an hour following splashdown, we saw Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma make their way out of the Dragon and into the recovery ship's medic facilities, safe and sound. So they're on the recovery vessel right now. Next, they'll catch a helicopter flight back to shore while they're transferred to aircraft that will take them home. Shane, Megan, and Aki will take a NASA plane for a short flight back to Houston, and Toma will fly back to Europe. And they'll be reunited with their families and then bring this historic flight to an end. It has been an honor and a privilege to share their journey with you all as we continue this new era in human spaceflight, but we have more coming up soon. That is right. Uh, SpaceX and NASA are already looking forward to the next mission when Crew-3 launches, currently targeted just a few days from now on November 10th. Uh, we'll have an indirect handover with three people on board the station for a short period of time as we continue this regular cadence of flying astronauts on American rockets from the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, again, it has been an, an, an incredible honor, Gary, uh, and joy uh, to share this uh, mission with the public and all the teams SpaceX and NASA continue to work hard to keep America leading the world in human spaceflight. Uh, continue to follow SpaceX and NASA online and on social media for updates for the very latest on crew and cargo flights uh, to and from the International Space Station. And we'll continue to share the progress of Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma as they travel back home on social media. So we'll say thanks once more uh, for tuning in and cheering on Shane, Megan, Aki, and Toma as they return home. And we'll see you again very soon when we'll once again be sending astronauts to the International Space Station from American soil on NASA SpaceX Crew-3 mission. Until then, so long. <laughs>